I wanted to let our listeners know that I will be giving a lecture and a workshop for the Oregon Friends of C.G. Young. The lecture will be October 15th from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. And this is a virtual event. The workshop, which is also a virtual event, will be the following day. And you can come to one or you can come to both. The title of my presentation is Another Whom We Do Not Know, Dreams as the Voice of the Inner Companion. And uh, my focus obviously will be on dreams and dream interpretation. And I'm really excited about it. So I'd love to have some This Jungian Life fans in the audience. And we will put the link in the show notes. Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Shadow is a veil behind which resides a darkly splendid world of unrestrained instinct, fantasy, and drive. And like Dionysus, yielding to it might create a kind of ecstasy of relief and or a dismemberment of who we thought that we should be. Most importantly, shadow is full of life, a raw life that fuels individuation if held in the right way, and the path that leads in the right direction is paved with a kind of inexhaustible curiosity. So we're going to harness that curiosity and talk more deeply about shadow and about how our interest in shadow is fueling some of our new projects and some of the things that we have in development. Uh, what I'm thinking about, Joseph, and what you're inviting us into uh, is how knowing about shadow as an intellectual construct, and it's vital in Jung Jungian work, and actually living it, confronting it, engaging with it, oh, two very different things experience of shadow and and just being even able to be curious about it and and go there uh, stir up a lot of very powerful feelings in addition to curiosity shadow is compelling mm. it has this gravitational field and our personal shadow always has us in its orbit because it is intrinsically part of the life that we are. It's part of the image of wholeness that's inside of us. Even if we don't know what to do with those impulses and drives, or perhaps we don't live in an environment that would allow us to even explore it. More problematically, we can be raised in a culture 
where we are not even permitted to know it about ourselves. And that's where people get really locked up. And then they wind up coming into analysis with a bunch of symptoms and sufferings because of the locked upness of it. Yeah, that they can't access this part of their personality that that could be a real source of energy and even renewal. And instead can often present itself as a kind of righteous or rule-bound uh, attitude. And people will go to great lengths to first convince themselves that they are not part of this fantasy that's roaming around in them. And then depending on how threatening the fantasy is, when they see some nuance of their own repressed fantasy in other people, they go to war with it or go to war with those other folks. A kind of unconscious virtue signaling that people believe is going to protect them from acting out their own problematic behavior. And I say problematic in as much as it's not congruent with who they thought they were. I think the theme here that I'm aware of is how we want to believe and how much we identify with our egos. And that shadow really shakes that and and sometimes even claws at ego's illusory grip on us. And that feels very, very threatening at times. Yeah, we, do, we have an image of who and what our ego is that by the time we're adults is pretty well shaped. I'm this kind of a person and I live this kind of a life and I have these kinds of values. Often they're profoundly influenced by the culture that we're raised in, but across the board, they're generally things that have been approved of and sanctioned. And therefore, when we're aligned with them, we get this sanctioning nod, this benediction from the power systems around us. So it's a marvelously self-reinforcing process. Yeah, and really coming face to face with something that's shadowy in yourself has a way of laying us low. It is a very um, depressing humbling, deflating process, and something that we would all prefer to avoid. I'm thinking of a friend of mine who shared an experience like this. She had um, allowed herself to get drawn into an affair. She was married. She had a brief affair with someone who was quite inappropriate. He was much younger than she was, and technically uh, he worked for her, so it was really illicit on a bunch of different levels. And it really confronted her with many things about herself. But she recalled that one of the most painful things was this awareness that she had been so susceptible to this because she had such a desire to be admired. And it was this quality in herself, this hunger to be admired that she hadn't really known about before, not, not consciously, not fully, not in an integrated way. It hit very hard. It landed very heavy to see that and really know that about herself. And that is uh, the paradoxical and powerful essence of shadow, isn't it? Is that... Uh, we are we go along being unconscious of what we are unconscious of, and then when it emerges and stands right in front of us, demanding to be recognized, it, it really takes us aback in powerfully felt ways. And it is so powerful when we have a desire or a need, whether it's to be admired or affirmed in any number of different ways. And for some reason, that's been pushed under, or we've been shamed out of thinking some measure of that was inappropriate. It boils and heats underneath the surface. And then much like a volcano, it kind of comes up through a fissure in the ground, and then it's twice as powerful as it might have been, you know, a couple of years earlier, because the need 
the primal desire for it finally will not tolerate being set aside, and it demands some kind of a satisfaction. And and Joseph, too expand your metaphor a little bit, because I think that this was actually operating in this person's life, and this was something she recognized. It had been operating in an ongoing way that had been disavowed. So it was a little bit more like those volcanoes in Hawaii, where the the lava is just kind of constantly seeping out of a crack. Mm-hmm. But it, But it's like her back was turned to it, and she didn't even know it, that she'd been motivated by that in many areas of her life in a way that she was able to disavow and she was able to not know about it until it came up in this, this more uh, destructive way. I think that is, um, again, what is so very difficult about shadow is how could I have not known that? You know, how could I have turned my back on lava seeping steadily out of a fissure in the earth? Uh, And the earth, unfortunately, is me. And I didn't know something that suddenly seems obvious and truly awful. Yeah, and just humiliating. Uh, Yes. Humiliating not to know it. But Mm -hmm. after time, I would hope, not humiliating to know about oneself. I mean, to know that somebody wants to be admired, I mean, everybody who's getting dolled up on a Saturday night, to some degree, is you know, wants to be appreciated or wants to be admired in some measure. I mean, it kind of drives enormous factors in the culture. Everybody running to the gym or Weight Watchers in January, you know, in the back of the story, they're going to emerge from the transformative process and people are going to go, wow. You're amazing. That's amazing. So, I mean, there's something so reasonable about wanting to be admired. Mm -hmm. And for us to get to the place where we can have a friendly, relaxed relationship with that desire is profoundly liberating. Well, and you're talking about the process of integrating that desire, of integrating something that feels shadowy or disallowed. You know, any time that we're not in touch with the shadow, we're a little bit inflated. And the wonderful thing about shadow is that it does bring with it humility. And the root of the word humility comes from a Latin word for low. So it puts us right in touch with our groundedness. Right, humus, so we mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's not a bad thing. And in fact, it's dangerous to be too cut off from shadow. Mm-hmm. Because then we're not in touch with the ground. We don't have our roots in the earth. I'm just going to take a step back and supply the steps here of shadow awareness. You mentioned the last uh, stage of shadow awareness, which is um, integrating. And that's what we've been talking about with this uh, friend you have described, is how do we integrate it and make it conscious? But Where we start, all of us, is that our shadow is unconscious. You know, I really don't know about it. And then the next stage, and I think we typically see this in other people more readily than we can sometimes see it in ourselves, is that we project it. It's not me. It's my friend so-and-so who is always like this, 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 and this. And James Hollis, one of our teachers, a Jungian analyst and author, always says that if you would really like to get acquainted with your own shadow, think of somebody in your life that you don't like, who drives you crazy, who's just (laughs) so irritating. That might be an introduction there to what you have projected onto the other person. And then the pitfall here is that we can get swept up in shadow that everybody's going to this wild and crazy party that got totally out of control. Well, you know, we got swept up in something shadowy. Yeah, so you can get identified with it. Identified. And then the last is this process that your friend obviously engaged in of of integrating it and, and getting to be, as Joseph said, on a friendly relationship with it. Like, so, okay, who doesn't want to be admired? We all do. It's okay that when we can relate to it and turn a friendlier face to it, our shadows are often really not all that dark 
and awful as we initially imagined. And this was an important part of the early psychoanalytic frame, that the most primal instincts that human beings can carry can be sublimated into art, into sports, into all kinds of symbolic expressions where the energies are allowed to come forward, do have a place inside of us, but they're more damaging or more dangerous elements have somehow been softened by a kind of aesthetic context. So Freud's, one of his substantial observations is that often people have highly aggressive and highly erotic feelings for each other that the culture does not make space for, for any number of reasons. And his supposition was that human beings developed sports <laughs> as a way of funneling that kind of war making mm -hmm. aspect, but also the intimacy of physically engaging and the eroticism of that. So to have that in the ritual of a football game uh, that oh, everybody yes. can watch and cheer and the incredible libido, let's say around the football phenomena in the United States, speaks to how important this is both individually but culturally that that fire needs some place to go for the safety of the culture. And that's, that's actually strikes me as a healthier way of dealing with it, that it is afforded its own particular place and aesthetics and it's welcomed in this rarefied form because I think another way that we tend to deal with it culturally, which one of the two of you have already pointed out, or maybe you both have, is that we project it onto another in the culture, another political party, another religious group, another some, mm -hmm. some group, and say, they're the problem. They're the ones that are doing everything wrong. Unfortunately, I feel like that is getting acted out in a really dark way in the culture now between people who are choosing to get vaccinated and those who are not, that these two groups are tending to demonize one another. So what we don't feel comfortable with in ourselves, we're projecting onto the other group and then really engaging in a, in a kind of mental exercise where we see them as all bad. And that can be very destructive for a culture and honestly is... I think the basis upon which many wars have been fought. Oh, absolutely. So we have a progression here in effect from displacing this uh, aggression uh, into a sports arena, maybe, um, you know, the modern day version of a sort of gladiatorial uh, contest, and it is football season to this kind of terrible polarity in our culture, whether it's over vaccinations, political parties, or a lot of other issues, to outright war. That when it's out there collectively, it tends to be the enemy. And we don't tend to question whether um, it's really our enemy. I mean, a football game, it's uh, as clear as clear can be that the two teams are basically uh, fighting one another. And then we can also rationalize, in quotes, um, you know, some of the political issues uh, as right and wrong judgments, who's we're right, they're wrong. And if it escalates even further, of course, um, on many a battlefield, thousands of people can die. So the, the price of not acknowledging shadow can be very steep. And I want to make a little bit of a distinction between having a sense of values versus being caught in a lot of shadow material, because part of any civilization is the development of attitudes and values that allow civil society to exist, so we're not in a constant murderous competition with each other. So we have these tools in a civilization which are kind of agreements that allow us to evolve. And then we have the oppression, not redirecting, but oppression 
of certain things. There are certain qualities that are dramatically attacked within a particular civilization and culture, whether it's the culture of my home, my neighborhood, my church, my state, my area. And that when there is a war against something inside us as human beings, then we have a tendency to take that war out of our own psyche and put it into the community. And while we're talking about wars between nations, I'm thinking about wars within families. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, a 16 year old kid who comes out as gay in some very unsophisticated and not psychologically informed family structure. There was a time where sending a teenage kid out of the home because they were not congruent with the expectations of the parents was way too common and still happens in the United States, which is, I think, a great tragedy. But we've all either seen or participated in or perhaps been marginalized by various systems that we have not fit into or been told that we do not fit into, and therefore there is no place for us. And that's an outer enactment of something that the accuser is going through inside of themselves, because you wind up representing the thing in them that must not be permitted. And the fantasy, of course, in the projection is, if they drive you out into the desert, then they are then temporarily relieved of the impulse to act in a similar way. Mm -hmm, yeah. So it goes to scapegoating. Goes to scapegoating. I want to lift up the difference between confronting something shadowy within ourselves, as in the story I shared about my friend who recognized this dreaded desire to be admired, versus being confronted with shadow when we see it being lived out by someone else. And in fact, these might not be two such terribly different things, because often when we see shadow in someone else, as you were talking about, Joseph, it brings up a very strong response in us because of what we don't want to know about ourselves. Nevertheless, I think that those two things can feel very different. So when I have a confrontation with my own behavior, it has that sense of being humiliating or bringing me low versus when I see it being acted out in the life of another person in which I'm likely going to defend against it in some way. I think that is such a good point and how quickly, really automatically, our defenses come up and I think there's just a huge range. Uh, the first one, of course, is judgment. That's awful. Oh, God, isn't that, you know, quickly repudiating and judging so that we don't have to feel it. We just take a direct route up to what we think is our neocortex of uh, objective, quote, unquote, judgment. Sometimes we get scared. Uh, sometimes we're horrified, sometimes disgusted, uh, sometimes strangely fascinated, and then we quickly repudiate it. Or not, or you stay fascinated with it. And get you swept know, shadow up. shadow is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we, we want to reach out and help the person, help in quotation marks, or rescue someone. I think there are a lot of ways to avoid our own feelings that get lit up by someone else's shadow. And, and just to, to make a further distinction, so there are two ways. Either we see someone being victimized by something that is shadowy, or we see someone living some shadowy material out. And they can bring up very, very different feelings. So I'm going to offer two entirely uh, kind of hypothetical 
uh, examples from my own practice that are sort of amalgams of things that I may have seen. So for example, working with someone who uh, maybe is self-employed and reveals to me that he is not reporting any of his income to the IRS. And what are the feelings that come up in me when I hear that? Uh, and, I, I'll, and I'll tell you that the feelings might be, you know, judgment, like you were saying, Deb, fear for the person, because they're engaging in, in a behavior that could be very, very risky. And there may be, and this is the shadowy part, some envy, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm reporting every red penny. And so I'm seeing someone kind of get away with something. The other example might be someone who has been very unfortunate and has uh, uh, suffered greatly, let's say. Um, perhaps the person is a victim of sexual trauma and in that way has been affected by shadow. And then I might feel a kind of overwhelming sense of helplessness sitting with someone whose life has been touched by shadow in this way, an awareness that shadow is so much bigger than my ego, that I would like to perhaps rescue this person. There may be an impulse of that, but that that's really beyond the scope of what I can do mm -hmm. as an individual. And yet this is something that gets pulled up in us when we face this. That goes to the one of the red markers around shadow mm -hmm. is that I seem to be having an emotional response that is disproportionate to what I'm observing. It's not that we shouldn't have feelings, but if it seems odd or disproportionate or it seems to be coming out of left field, you know, somebody's walking down the street and they're dressed in a certain way and I suddenly feel incredibly critical or hostile towards them. I mean, we should notice that and notice that it is really happening only inside of me. This person is just happy to go along in whatever way that they want to go along. And I can say to myself, this is, I'm not at risk. No one's harming me. There's no, there's no logical reason I should be feeling this negative about something that has no impact on me. And yet many people don't ask that question. And then they go careening forward, mm -hmm. getting involved with something which really should be happening in a purely internal world. Well, I think, um, this links up for me with the deep tap roots that shadow has uh, in our very, very early uh, infancy and childhood. And uh, it's born in the relationships with intimate others in our families, our parents, other adults. And it's primal. It has a very primal, reactive root. And that root is often to take action, to, to, to protest, to be rageful, to be envious, um, all these kind of really primordial emotions that go back to our earliest beginnings. And that's what makes shadow so powerful. So the first step in an analysis is shadow work. I mean, people come to young, they want to talk about their dreams or maybe even religious visions. They want to talk about Jung's amazing ideas. They want to read books. And of course, you know, it's a lot of fun to sit down with our analysis and talk about ideas. I mean, that's an incredibly seductive thing for me to just sit and talk about amazing ideas. And yet the real beginning of the work is helping somebody face the things that they don't want to know about themselves, but are in fact regular companions that walk around with them in their lives. And it's really difficult work. And, uh, you know, it, it separates the wheat from the chaff in terms of people who are really appropriate for analysis versus people who want some kind of a yeah. supportive therapy that they might have in mm -hmm. some other environment. Because part of shadow work, just as we were saying, involves confrontation. And confrontation is just the introduction of information that is not congruent with how you thought things were. And Joseph, your point before that when you're particularly activated, that's 
a signifier, perhaps, that you are meeting shadow material. So when we feel a particular energy around something, it can be a good idea to say, hmm, where is this in me? What is this about in me? So any strong reaction ought to pique our curiosity. I think it might be important to just touch on why we do shadow work. And that, uh, you know, for Freud, it was just sort of rummaging through and excavating uh, sort of the slag heap of unprocessed experiences and emotions. But what Jung discovered through his uh, process of study and myth and culture and history and all the rest is that the underbelly of shadow is the rich treasure of energy, creativity, a sense of liberation. And that's why we do shadow work, is that instead of sequestering that energy and trying to suppress it uh, and, and keeping it hidden, we can use it for life. It can be admitted to the table of consciousness and make us more present, more alive, uh, and per Jung, individuated and whole. It's going somewhere. And that's the point of doing shadow work. And, and we need that energy. That There's a certain kind of fuel that we need to move towards individuation. And if we have lost half the gas in our psychological tank because it's buried somewhere underground, we're not going to get there. We are stymied to the degree that we refuse to do our shadow work. And so the thing that you want to complain about, the thing that you want to stop somebody else from doing, the thing that you're sure your criticism is totally righteous about and fiercely mm -hmm. righteous about, those are all of the areas where we would take a breath, pick up our journal, start writing this stuff down, and begin to relax into a reverie around how is this related to me. One of the places I think that people get really stuck, though, is they make too exact a correlate. So we watch somebody, I don't know, let's say cut off somebody in traffic and we just think it's a horrible, egregious thing. I know this is a pretty common example. And then we're like screaming at them for doing it. Is it really that I want to cut, cut everybody off in traffic and I'm just repressing that so horribly? Mm-hmm. Yes, it could be that specific, but it rarely is. Is it something else that's more subtle, like I'm not permitted to let myself be first? I'm not permitted to experience urgency, or I'm not a, you know, permitted to take a risk or to be even aggressive in certain circumstances, that so many things could be moving around the observation of that person cutting somebody off in traffic, that deserves a much more subtle curiosity than just thinking it's about the thing I just observed. Yeah, that's a really interesting, <clears throat> sorry, let me start that again. That's a really interesting point, Joseph, and it actually brings up for me something that happened a number of years ago. There was a man whom I admired greatly. I thought of him as a real wisdom figure. Uh, he had been a teacher to me in a certain context. And I just happened to be in like one of those um, parking garages. And I saw him, he was in a car. I saw him, he didn't see me. And, and first of all, he was driving a Jaguar. Wow. And I didn't, I didn't know that he drove a Jaguar. <laughs> and, and secondly, he sort of uh, skipped through a stop sign and just got right in front of me in this very aggressive way. And it was sort of staggering to me that this man that I looked up to could sort of be so, I don't know, I want to say like inconsiderate. I'm thinking of other words too, but I'll just go with that one. <laughs> And it, it was, it was a little, I, I was a little stung, you know, it's like I sort of had to withdraw some of my projections about him, but mm -hmm. I think it goes to what 
you were saying though too is that what i i could see those idealized aspects of him but part of him being in the world the way that he was was an ability to be kind of commanding and authoritative and even to insist on being first sometimes that that was part of who he was that it was harder for me to relate to because it, those things were in the shadow for me. This idea of having one's shadow hooked, I think is a, is a clever Jungian idea, is that each of the things which we could be aware of, but for whatever reason we are not, is like a little fish hook. And it's constantly trawling through the water around us and it gets snagged sometimes on something that's very dramatic, but sometimes on something that is extremely subtle. And then our job is to kind of reel it in and take a look at it. But I'd like to lean into a little bit of my experience early on as a social worker. When I was doing classic social work, which is dealing with people that are have inadequate resources, or they're disabled in certain ways and need support. I worked in a psychiatric hospital. People were uh, often in very dramatically disoriented states of being, and they were trying to get themselves back together. All three of us being social workers puts us in touch with marginalized populations. And one of the first things that we come up against is the shadow projections that the culture brings upon marginalized groups. The assumptions, the negative assumptions make about people who are homeless, or the negative assumptions that the culture will make about somebody who is addicted to a substance. And having to find resources and build bridges for that person and the community is something that we were constantly working through and fighting with much of these cultural prejudices. Yeah. I'm thinking of this, this, this thing that happened to me uh, that, that speaks, I think a lot to that and how shadow gets wrapped up in that. I was living in a transitional neighborhood where there were many people with limited means and, uh, You know, I was just finishing graduate school at the time. And I also started working for the VA. So I was uh, seeing Vietnam vets and I was running groups. And I remember I would walk through my neighborhood and most of the people in my neighborhood were of a different socioeconomic background from the one that I grew up in. And I would see people walking their dogs and then not cleaning up their dog poop And think to myself, well, I guess that's a cultural thing. The people in this neighborhood don't, you know, people in this neighborhood of this socioeconomic background don't care so much about cleaning up the dog poop. That was just a sort of automatic place I went to in my head. So kind of putting shadow on another group. And then I remember being in one of the uh, groups for Vietnam vets that I was running And one of the vets who uh, came, you know, he came from a marginalized group, lower socioeconomic status. Um, He was a person of color. He was talking about how he hated walking on up on the Upper East Side because the upper class white people who lived up there never cleaned up their dog's poop. (laughs) And I thought, oh, so it's just human. <laughs> Nobody wants to pick up their dog Nobody poop. cleans no up their... No one ever wanted to do that. No one does that. And we Nobody just... wants it. But we put it on the other group. But it's just... There it is. It's just human. Yeah. We don't like to clean up dog poop. And I think we're circling around a kind of a theme that uh, has to do with fairness and justice. And that that's a place where shadow comes up very quickly of... That's not right. That's not fair. Uh, you're taking more than your share, or you, uh, you're failing in some social responsibility. I remember uh, living in New York and coming back home over a weekend, going down 
FDR Drive to tr take the Brooklyn Bridge, and people can cut in. It's always a long line on a weekend of cars, but you can always cut in because it's hard to not let eventually uh, somebody who wants to cut in weasel his way in. And I just always wish that there were policemen there, you know, get those scofflaws who don't want to wait their turn in line. Weasels. Weasels. And <laughs> people that don't clean up their dog poop. And I myself once yelled at someone whose dog had pooped right in front of my house. So I'm just wanting to highlight how strongly these kinds of issues around shadow that has to do with fairness and what you should do of our moral obligations. I think it's an especially strong area where we can get um, very righteous very quickly. And in fact, there's some justification for it. People shouldn't cut in line and they should pick up their dog poop. Yeah, but but I think that the shadow work is recognizing that some days we're the one who cuts the line. <laughs> there it and is. And <laughs> some days we're the one who doesn't pick up our dog's poop. Yes. Right. But there's a there's a value that we are talking about these kind of social norms or yes. these rules that we think will help the majority of us. But in terms of just feeling that we are as human beings designed to feel disturbed when norms are not followed. And this was something, again, when we were kind of digging into our social work stuff, I had just not been terribly conscious of what the norms are for a particular culture. And we here in Virginia are in a very interesting place. We've just passed this change of laws about marijuana use, where um, there was a very intolerant attitude towards recreational use of marijuana. And then lo and behold, We've had this kind of revolution. Now, any adult, I believe over 21 in Virginia, can grow up to three marijuana plants. And so, lo and behold, in my neighborhood, I'm seeing <laughs> peeking out from the sides of people, these like eight foot marijuana plants are kind of like growing. You know, you're not supposed to be able to see them from the street, but you really can. You know, and the scent of marijuana is kind of, you know, floating through my middle class neighborhood. And how quickly. That norm, it's gone from just being an absolute problem to being something that's becoming extraordinarily casual. And so things that people were punished for severely, really severely, now has transformed. Another thing that I'm very aware of, particularly in Virginia Beach, because we're a beach community, is how ubiquitous tattoos have become. Yes. I mean, I remember... As a kid, I was born in 62, but tattoos were strange. My father had a tattoo, a faded one on his forearm, which I somehow didn't pay much attention to. But when I saw substantial tattoos on people, it was like they were from another planet. I would like gawk at people when I was five <laughs> years old out of the side of the car. And now, go to the beach, everybody has a tattoo. Men, women, babies, you know, like everybody has a tattoo. It's so, it's just um, remarkable. Joseph, sh should we tell the listeners about the matching tattoos that the three of us have? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> <Shh>. <laughs> yeah, so what you're saying is what's in the cultural shadow can shift. It does shift dramatically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which also should give us a certain objectivity about our own righteousness, that lo and behold, even within the course mm. of our own lives, we've seen things go from being outrageous to being so ordinary that they're barely noticed anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we're situated in a really righteous position, it would be helpful to remember how many things have suddenly become no big deal that were a really big deal. And as you mentioned just a few minutes ago, of those are all parts of us too, sometimes in very subtle ways. And that if we can engage those parts of ourselves, our shadows, I think it should lead to compassion. The people that are marginalized uh, in society with whom we have 
wanted and have engaged on our Shadowland series of that can we engage with them? Uh, can we extend ourselves? Can we have both curiosity of just interest in what is your life like? Tell me about yourself. And some sense that, wait a minute, uh, perhaps these people as people, they're not so different from us. I think that, that would be the goal. And that's certainly something we experience as psychotherapists. Mm. People come into our work having lived lives that we have no personal experience of or might seem radically different from the way that we've lived. And there needs to be a bridge based on, as you said, Deb, compassion. So as we're putting together the Shadowland episodes, and we'll be releasing them in, at this time or that time, the entire point of the Shadowland project was to give people an opportunity to move beyond their own righteous anxiety around it and to hear the humanity of these various individual and I would hope imagine that they could find themselves in these places if not for certain twists or turns. Right. Nothing that is human is alien to me. Quite right. There but for the grace of God go I. If we think of it as disastrous, but sometimes people who are living in the shadow found it a refuge mm -hmm. and have found it to be a rather glorious freedom to not be constrained necessarily, but that we can understand pretty much anything, even if it frightens us, even if it overwhelms us. Every human behavior has a certain frame around it that if we had enough information on enough levels, we could feel a sense of relief that something is understandable, which is not the same thing as saying that I would do it necessarily or that I sanction it, but it is not outside the realm of human nature to find oneself in all kinds of interesting, novel, and very complicated situations. You know, I think that being a therapist is a little bit like being a novelist, mm -hmm. in that you have to enter the experience of someone whose life might be drastically different than yours and use all of your empathic imagination to understand that experience as if from the inside. So if you're writing a novel about uh, a gang member and that's not your experience, that you are called upon to write a decent novel to really know that person's psyche and to portray their experience in a way that would be believable. And, and I think that when we sit with someone whose life experience is very different from ours, we're pulling on similar strengths in ourselves, hopefully. That, no, I've never done that. And I, I have sat with people who have, you know, killed people, let's say, you know, for various, for various reasons and various contexts, one of which is, you know, they were, they were in the military. And talking about this. And no, that's not something that I have. But do I have the, the courage to imagine that? Can I be with that person who's done that? Joseph, as you said, not sanctioning it, but knowing it, understanding it. It asks a lot of us to do that. And I do think that's one of the things that we're offering on Shadowlands. And I think there is a drive for people to lay claim to shadow. And we see that in the entertainment industry constantly. How Americans will show up at the movies to watch these theatrical accounts of all kinds of behavior that would never be permitted in the culture. But something inside of us wants to brush against all dimensions of human behavior. So we do go to movies where people are murdering somebody or somebody is uh, a 
prostitute or a drug addict or a criminal, the Sopranos, you know, uh, people were falling in love with Tony Soprano once they really got a chance to know him through these <laughs> scenes of his therapy. Mm -hmm. But something in us wants to forge what feels like a safe bridge mm -hmm. to these behaviors and images and walk away feeling that we know something about that dimension and did that in a way that didn't harm us or perhaps harm anybody else. So we are very, very curious about ways of living that we have not personally encountered. I think certainly uh, theater, football games, uh, movies, TV series uh, give us those opportunities. But I think the turning point, the pivot point is whether we enjoy those things as voyeurs, as vicarious experiences into some realm we don't live in, or whether we then go home and say, some part of that is also living in me. I think that that, that probably doesn't happen too often, but I think unconsciously it does work in the back mm -hmm. of the scene. You know, for instance, I think of the television series Will and Grace, and all of a sudden these kind of charming gay characters were showing up in the living rooms of people f for months after months after months, and all of a sudden people started developing a sense of affection for the characters, which then changed how they felt and how they imagined they would be around somebody like that. And that process of imagining changed the culture uh, without question. So I think sometimes it can work really consciously. Sometimes it can be humming a little bit below the surface, but it speaks to the, the trend of psyche to want to know. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's coming up for me is I'm, I'm a big fan of Leo Tolstoy. And I remember reading that he was inspired to write Anna Karenina after seeing something in the newspaper about a woman who had killed herself. And perhaps it was also true that the woman who had killed herself had uh, been involved in an extramarital affair. I can't remember if that was part of the, the actual story. But in any case, he came up with this idea to write this novel about this woman who was engaged in an extramarital affair. And initially, he felt very censorious toward his protagonist, toward Anna. He was going to use the novel to show how morally bankrupt she was. I mean, Tolstoy was a pretty judgmental dude, actually. And what happened was, in the act of bringing her to life, in the act of ensouling her through fiction, by attempting to enter into the psyche that he created with his own empathic imagination, he found that he loved her and he understood her, even though he didn't condone her actions. We as readers of the novel, and the reasons it's you know one of the great novels ever written, is because we understand Anna. We feel compassion for her. Her plight is entirely believable, and though tragic, we can relate to it and see ourselves in her. And, and I think that that's exactly an example of mm -hmm. what can happen when we hold shadow in another in the right way. So what your examples, uh, Lisa and Joseph, uh, show is that through theater, f fiction, and many other vehicles, we can be introduced to shadow in a way that is friendly. So we are learning to turn a friendly face to that which, like Tolstoy, was initially anathema. And when we're exposed to it, like Will and Grace coming into the living room every week, it really changes how we feel toward it, doesn't it? Uh, that knowing something up close and, and kind of personal 
even in, perhaps especially in, the imaginal realm, changes our attitude. Absolutely. If we can imagine something as benign or even positive, or at least not frightening, we can begin to have a conversation. And this is very similar when we have nightmares. There are figures who we are unfamiliar with or who represent contents of our own psyches that are so incongruent with how we want to see ourselves that we either fight them or we flee from them. They're chasing after us, biting at our heels. These dreams can go on for months or years. And then when we finally stop in active imagination, turn and have a conversation, it is often shockingly banal. You know, like the monster coming towards you turns and says, you're a slob. You've been a (laughs) slob for years. You know, and people are like, that's it? You know, yes, because you defend against being sloppy. And the psyche really wants you to know you're a slob. So, I mean, it's hilariously benign sometimes. But boy, we will go to incredible lengths to not know something about ourselves if it was a particularly negative value in our upbringing. But coming back just um, before you move on to a dream, talking about um, Kay, who we all liked so much on our Uh. last Shadowlands episode and and just admiring how much life she had, how much uh, psychological acumen she had, how vulnerable, of course, she was. And how surprised I was in one sense. Some people had a really hard time getting to know Kay based on the feedback to the episode. And on the other side, some people just loved Kay. I mean, I think she could set up her own fan club that people thought so highly of her and how she deported herself during the interview. But it speaks to how polarized people are in themselves around something like sexuality and sex work and how difficult it is for them to listen with a soft heart and how difficult it is for some people to question the war-making impulse that rises up in them, which then they'll justify using all kinds of language as wars are always justified. But the real war is inside the person who is provoked by listening to the episodes. And it is sad when we hear from people and there is an inadequate or missing self-reflection in the communication. I'm just thinking about um, how we started You started this whole idea, Joseph, of doing a series on Shadowlands, of of the people that we don't see, we don't know about them, who live in our collective shadows. What it means in all kinds of dimensions that we've just been discussing to really engage shadow, not so much in terms of K in some sense, then what happens in you, in me? What feelings are evoked? Uh, and shadow is sticky. It's mucky and it's yucky and it's multidimensional. You know, and I know that uh, I mean, all three of us found Kay so incredibly courageous and articulate and touching. Uh, she was willing to come forward and share herself and, and dare us to engage with her on her terms. I think it's important for people to understand that when a stranger contacts us because they're interested in coming onto the show, that we have a very different process with them as we prepare with them to do an episode than would ever possibly happen in an analysis. You know, we contact people, we correspond, we let them know exactly what this process is. We let them know the limits of it. You know, they sign all kinds of release forms. They listen to the interview. They're able to delete anything that they're not comfortable with, as are we, by the way. Or they can delete their entire experience if they want. 
Yeah, nobody's obligated. But what I appreciate is the courage that people like Kay yeah. have to bring forward themselves with the desire to be seen and understood. Mm -hmm. And even if a listener thinks, well, I don't want to see that, and I don't want to understand that, I just want that away from me, that's the opportunity for the listener to take a breath and turn in and to ask, what am I seeing in this mirror that I have a poor relationship to or have never considered? And I think that's uh, it's a powerful opportunity for healing and wholeness on the part of the listener. Maybe this is a time to switch to a dream. Yes. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, it was released on May 25th, and sales have been strong. And I've been receiving so many lovely emails and texts and phone calls from, from friends and from uh, people that I don't know telling me how much they've enjoyed the book. And so that feels really great. The reviews on Amazon have all been glowing, and that's been really heartening. It's just really wonderful to know that this project of mine is resonating with so many people. I'm just uh, so happy for you, and it's such a lovely, lovely book, both deep and accessible, about the inner journey around being a mother. It's never been, that's never been written about. It hasn't been out there. And that it's getting such an enthusiastic, heartfelt reception. It's wonderful. Yeah. I would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on Amazon because <laughs> although there are many wonderful ones there, um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers that needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. <laughs> yes. That speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think they're right, Joseph. The, the analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be <laughs> missed. <laughs> it's having a life of its own, which yeah. is just what we want. That's right. Mm. Our dreamer is a 47-year-old male who is an executive in a nonprofit. And here's his dream. I'm in the backyard of my grandparents' house. It's night and very dark out, and I can see the lights on in the house. I have a bird feather in my hand that is luminescent with green and purple. I stick it in the ground, and a bird appears, a dove, I think. It flies away, and I stick the feather in the ground a second time. Another bird appears and flies away. I do it a third time, but this time I take a feather from the bird that appears and replant it in the same spot. When I do this, the ground trembles. Something big is happening, and I've started something I can't stop. The third bird flies back to me and tells me to find a swan to make something called svala. Then I'm at some sort of school party, like a reunion or homecoming. I see an Indian woman I knew and used to be friends with. We haven't seen each other in a long time, and we are no longer close. But I think she might know the meaning of svala, and how I'm supposed to make it and what to do. I keep trying to talk to her, but things keep getting in the way. She finally invites me to her room. There is beautiful music playing in the background, and her room is full of soft golden light. I tell her about the dream with the feather and needing a swan to make svala, and that I don't know what it's about. She laughs and says, What is a swan but transformation? The hardest part in making svala is finding the swan. For context, he writes, My grandparents raised me, and the house in a dream is where I grew up. I don't know the Indian woman in the dream. I started Jungian analysis about six months ago and tackling some depression and alcoholism. Both grandparents have passed away, but I recently had a family interaction after years of separating from them 
that left me feeling more empowered and less angry that they do not do more to help me in my life. The main feeling in the dream was a mix of reverence and fear in the beginning, joy in seeing an old friend, but some frustration in not getting the answers. And a bit more explanation. He writes, I don't know the word svala, and Google has not been much help. <laughs> What a marvelous fairy tale ish dream. Yeah, oh, it's such a fairy tale. Yes. And I have noticed um, us smiling as you read the dream that the hardest part in making Svala is finding the swan. <laughs> so he's, he's accomplished that. The swan is there. <laughs> One of the first things that I notice, of course, is the setting and that he's in the backyard of this house where he grew up. So this tells me that we're dealing with a kind of family of origin complex here. And that something really, really shifts. He sets in motion some big process that's going to change a lot of things. So, and he, and he does say in the associations that there'd been some kind of interaction that was, that was healing. So some way that he might be reconfiguring how he has understood his life and his place in his family, for example. So I'm thinking about what you've said, Lisa, and that rings true. I'm thinking about the feathers and the birds. So he has a feather in his hand, and he plants it twice, and he gets a bird out of it. And it looks like that could continue to happen iteratively. And it's a little bit like planting a seed. Plant a feather, get a bird. Plant a corn kernel, you get a corn plant. You know, there's this interesting planting and growing. But it's when he deviates from that, and then he takes a feather from a bird that had just sprouted from the ground. He's trying something new. He's not using the same old feather but something fresh, something that's just emerged. And by making that transition, the atmosphere shifts, the ground starts trembling, and all of a sudden this whole other second part of the dream is kicked off. So as it is in many fairy tales and myths, there's this fateful experiment that somebody tries that sets in motion a thing which at first could even seem cataclysmic like an earthquake, but is going to the necessary place. And I wonder if that might be his entering analysis. Mm. On the planting of the feathers, I just wanted to add that there's a sort of a union of the opposites in the image because he's taking a feather, something that is associated with flight, with lightness, and he's putting it in the earth upon which there's a bird. So there's some sort of opposing energies being constellated here, that of putting something in the earth and grounding it and something taking flight. And the third bird also flies back and can talk. So like we've really transferred into a whole other world as if it wasn't interesting before and is giving him instructions. Well, I think uh, in most fairy tales, when an animal gives you instructions, take the instructions. Like uh, <laughs> von Franz particularly felt that animals come out of that instinctive, clear level of the psyche that is not neurotic, is not ambivalent, and is very connected with nature. So when the bird tells you, find a swan, and make this substance, I suppose, we know that is truly the priority. And the dreamer seems to orient to that the right way. I mean, he does seem to take that quest on. I'm aware of a couple of things. Uh, one is the, the dream setting, the backyard of the grandparents' house. So uh, as you said, Lisa, it really evokes the family of origin since he was raised by his grandparents and the parental complex, uh, where he says in the context that uh, he's more at ease with his memories of how he was raised 
and not having been given um, enough help. And then we have the magical beginning of the all these interactions with birds and feathers and the third bird instructing him to find a swan make, and make this uh, substance, the svala. Then at the very end, the Indian woman um, comes back to this theme and says, well, the hard part about doing that is finding the swan to begin with. So that took me into what is a swan? I think birds often uh, sort of overall uh, represent a spirituality and, and a kind of transcendence because of their ability to fly. But a, but a swan both can, can fly and uh, it, is on the, it is a bird of the water. Uh, and I'm really enjoying uh, how swans inhabit both of those realms. It's as if they really unite the polarities. They're very solar. They're white. Um, they're, very, they're big, of course. They are celebrated in fairy tales. There are a number of fairy tales that feature swans. They are very, very big in Irish mythology and fairy tale. Uh, there is something especially uh, magical and benevolent and pure about a swan. And that that perhaps is the quest of the dreamer is, wait a minute, let's not worry too much about the svala and what that is. Uh, first, let's go find the swan. And that that's the quest is where is that in his life? Where is his swan? And I think it's coming on board. Maybe it's still in its uh, ugly duckling stage, but something is on the move in Psyche. And I did go to a symbol dictionary, and there is, as we might imagine, a lot about <laughs> swans, some of which you picked up on, uh, Deb. But I, I want to say that um, there's an interesting, well, and it's also interesting because it references India. So I'm reading from uh, Cooper's Illustrated Encyclopedia of Symbols. It says, Brahma rides a swan, goose or peacock, and the swan or goose is his emblem. It is the divine bird which laid on the waters the cosmic egg, the golden egg from which Brahma sprang, the supreme swan, the Paramahamsa, is the universal ground or the self with a capital S. Pretty amazing. And I... I'm I'm struck by two things here in the Dreamers Associations. One, he mentions somewhat offhandedly alcoholism. <laughs> and, and that brings into sharper focus for me this image of swans and feathers. You know, Jung Jung said of alcoholism that it's it's a thirst for the spiritual. It's looking for the spirit through spirits. And birds and feathers are associated with that which is spiritual. So somehow this this dreamer may be suffering from a spiritual hunger, a spiritual thirst that he's encountering in a new way through these these birds and these feathers. And also his comment about not being so angry about what he didn't get tells me that he's moving out of resentment. And that always means taking on board our own responsibility for things, which is quite transformational. In a way, we might even say that's the heart of any kind of therapeutic process, is being able to process feelings and then move into taking responsibility for our life choices. Yeah, you've got to find your own swan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The acceptance of this is what was, and then what can now be? Where is Psyche going? Where is my life going? What's the telos? I'm moved by the fact that she laughs and gives him this important information that it has to do with his transformation and that there is an alchemical process that he has to go through, but finding the swan is the first thing. If we imagine this is connected, as you were saying from the symbol book, with the self, it may very well be that his first task is to even get a glimpse 
of the self, to brush against the self in order to then consider this tincture, perhaps, that has to be made. And without some connection to the transcendent, I think the other efforts are not terribly well organized. I also like this sentence where he says that I've started something that I can't stop. Mm. So putting the different feather into the ground sets off a process that involves the anima, potentially a swan, and then some product that's associated with the swan. And that cannot be stopped. There's a feeling that this is irreversible, which is very sobering, undoubtedly. But often this is an extraordinary experience and an analysis that he is on the verge of knowing something that cannot be unknown, even if we're ambivalent about it. Well, I think the dream is not explicitly about shadow because we were discussing it. I think there is some relationship in as much as we learn things about ourselves, some beautiful, some shocking, and we can't unknow those things, that we are different once we know them. And depending on the power of the revelation, I mean, it can really shift the ground underneath us, create a bit of an earthquake, or it could be something that we you know, carry fairly lightly and easily. But for him, this is ground shaking. And I like that the second part of the dream, uh, e even though it's not quite as uh, magical as the first part of the dream, is a homecoming. Of, it comes back down to earth at this party reunion homecoming and a conversation with a woman from another culture, an Indian woman. And Lisa, you read the part uh, from, the, from the Simple Dictionary about what swans symbolize. And she is a very important figure, as you pointed out, Joseph, in the dream. A very, she's a wise woman. Well, she's also an anima figure. And a wise woman, anima figure. And, and that is part of the function of the anima, yeah. right? Is to lead you into the inner world. Yep. Uh, and, you know, at first, uh, when I first read this dream, um, that he keeps trying to talk to her, but things keep getting in the way. And I was like, oh, no. And then finally, she invites me into her room. And this lovely uh, imagery of music and soft golden light. Uh, so there's a connection made with his inner world through this a uh, very powerful, benevolent, wise anima figure who sees things differently. She is from another culture. She has another way of looking at things, and she is inviting him. I think it's full of promise. Mm -hmm. And even though his setup of dealing with depression and alcoholism on the surface might seem like really heavy lifting, something in the archetypal level, has risen up and offered yes. very explicit help. Yeah. So I think he is definitely on track. And he's perhaps setting out in a whole new way on the hero's journey to find a swan. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.